Uh, again, what is a font? Well, what we learned from our history of typography lecture the other day is that a typeface versus font, right? A typeface is, how do you define a typeface? Let's quiz everybody. I like random quizzes. How do you define a typeface, Ava? It's based on the font. It's Ooh. a representation of the font. Backtrack. The opposite. A typeface is the original design, design of the character set known as a typeface. A font, then, is the manufactured copy of said typeface made by possibly a foundry like Adobe or uh, Letraset or some other foundries. I can't, they're all house industries. We just talked about this and I can't remember. I can't remember. Let's see if we look in suitcase if it has the the foundry names. Monotype is one. Um, monotype, Linotype, Apple, ooh, Bigelow, Microsoft, etc. So these then right here are the names of the foundries, right? So we can typically say what font foundry made that font, okay? So again, in our world here, uh, digitally, our then manufactured copy of these fonts then, so if you go to my resources page, and you go down to the bottom under downloads uh, there is a link for fonts for Mike do what Mike says dot com this is a download that will then go in your download so it's a zip folder if you open that zip folder up uh, and then put things in your documents folder it comes as a folder called Western Fonts. Okay, so these here then are, let's see if there's E, E, F, G, E, F, G, E, F, G, E, Euro style, Euro style. Okay, so if we then open up this folder for Euro style, uh, it doesn't tell us the font foundry there, but these now are the manufactured copies, okay, of the typefaces that we use on our machines here, okay? So again, uh, when we were talking about the bounding box over here, if you have ever received a file from somebody and they don't send you the font, right? Because if you are working on a file so let's say this file logo uh, logo study type one if we have a piece of editable text right here and let's say this font is times and again uh, if you're watching this on video right and I go up to the, the screen and I point if you're watching it on video, you have no idea what I'm pointing to, right? Um, so <clears throat> this then times, if we change it to times New Roman, oops, right? What's actually happening here is this Illustrator document is using then a font that is on this machine. So 
let's say, have you ever, so those of you that are taking Web 110 uh, or uh, have taken Web 110 or Web 120, um, let's say it like this. When you do an HTML document and you write an image tag, and the uh, source attribute points to a file, correct? Right? That is similar to what's happening here right now. This Illustrator document is using then the font Times New Roman and it's pulling it from the folder in the system on this machine. Okay? Now, if we then take this right here, and we create outlines, it is no longer utilizing the file for Times New Roman. It has converted that type into now a piece of art. So it is now an object in Illustrator. Okay? Does that make sense ish? All right. Sense ish, yeah. Ish, yeah. Uh, here's here's what happened a long time ago. So, are you in my Web 105 class? No. Uh, anybody in here in my Web 105 class? Remember the story about the hairdresser that started taking my class, and then she came into my office and she's like, "I don't know if this is for me because I don't understand anything you're talking about." And I said, you're a first quarter student. You're not really supposed to understand everything I'm talking about. You're supposed to take it in and things will start to make sense to you. Well, now she's a high profile UX designer at Amazon and she's gonna sit on our technical advisory committee. So, um, hopefully that will be you or something like that, right? So, if we go back to the history of the font. So again, font. Uh, <coughs> origin, 16th century, denoting the action of process or casting or founding from the French word uh, fonte. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, that's how when you say French, something in French, you have, you have to say it like that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> something? <laughs> okay, so again, right, the whole founding, casting, so that's where that all comes from, okay? So let's go back a long time ago. Bitmap versus outline. So if you're in Photoshop, right? And, or if you've been a child, and how many of you, when you were a child, sat really super close to the TV? And of course your parents said, don't sit too close to the TV. Anybody, right? And now we're all on our phones 24-7. Ha ah, ha, parents, bah, right? But if you've ever done that and you see all the little red, green, and blue dots, right? And they change color to make up a bigger picture. If we were just to have that as a black and white world, right? Either a black square or not, right? That is one bit of data. So you put a bunch of black squares called bits together and you create then an image or a bitmap of a piece of type. As you can see here, that's relatively inefficient. But when computers were first starting out, that's what we did, right? And uh, found out that it was relatively inefficient, or not necessarily inefficient, but has anybody ever uh, tried to, in Photoshop, blow something up and then tried to print it, or if you blew it up, it got really, really blurry and distorted, right? Versus doing something, and how many of you have worked in Illustrator before? Okay, so. If we're working in Illustrator now, And we type out an R. And we do it times times Roman. And we make it 72. And then we make it a whole lot bigger. Okay. 
you saw that it started off really, really small. But if I print this, my TAs are so helpful. Look at them. They're just like. Thinking about how loud it is right behind my head. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to totally get on your nerves. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. It's okay. I don't because I don't really care if you love or hate me. Really, to be honest with you. I know. All I care is that you learn something. Well. So I can blow it up, right, and have it print out really nice and crisp and clear. This is because at the heart then of these fonts are, again, if I go to create outlines, right, that's where at the heart of these are, again, the vector lines, fills, points, and the program then will take those lines, fills, points, and mathematically adjust everything to then print out on a printer like that. And let's say it like this. Uh, how many of you have used Photoshop? And when you're in Photoshop, you have to set your document to a certain resolution, correct? 72, 300, 150, whatever resolution. Here in Illustrator, there is no resolution. Why? answer there are no dots per inch DPI or pixels per inch pixels PPI right which I always giggle when I say that but um, <laughs> instead the dots per inch is determined by this printer so this printer probably printed this R out and you can see that it's losing ink a bit or it needs a toner cartridge change but this uh, is being printed out probably at 600 dots per inch. Okay. A poster like this, uh, that's not a good example, but if anybody has a normal book, like, uh, does anybody have normal books, printed books? <laughs> what? I know. what is that? What? Ooh, yeah. Nerd points, <laughs> bonus points. This is probably printed out at 2,400 dots per inch, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which all come together to make the full color spectrum. Right. It is. It's a great, great book. Okay? So we're a long way away from bitmaps now. Again, we are using uh, outlines like I just showed you. Oops in the Illustrator. Uh, what's in a font? Well, the entire collection of characters then, right? In other words, if we have a font Times New Roman, and basically we designed the R of Times New Roman, uh, and then we design the other letters, etc., you will see that all the letters are based off of the curves. It's probably not a great uh, screenshot. In other words, it's not very big, but this is out of the book. Uh, what you will see is the curves in each letter are based off of curves from the other letter. In other words, it's been a long time since I actually designed a typeface, but there were parts of the letter forms that were reused and put together to make other letter forms, et cetera, et cetera which kind of defines the whole look and feel of this character set, okay? So now this thing right here, this character set, is actually what is in, if we go back here, and we take a look at one of these fonts, here's the thing. There are two different programs on these computers for managing fonts, and we'll get into it in a little bit. Uh, but if I basically chose, um, I don't know, Euro style bold, and I double clicked it, if I'm on a Mac, it is going to uh, bring up this screen right here, okay? This screen right here has just opened a program called Fontbook. 
So if you are, how many of you are on a Mac at home or have your own laptop, okay? Uh, you might use Fontbook to manage your fonts, okay? In other words, if I were to have all these fonts active and running on my computer, has anybody ever activated a whole bunch of fonts at one time and their computer just gave up and didn't die, but the pinwheel of death just kept on spinning for days, right? Okay. Well, if I then installed this font, it would bring me up with, problems have been found, install checked, great. Uh, it would bring me up with font book here, multiple copies, oh, that's why, multiple copies are installed. Uh, and if we then went to, let's see, where is it? The, here it is. The repertoire, if you will, right, of <coughs> what is inside this font, it contains all the characters, all the letters, etc. Okay? How many of you have ever been using a font and you typed out a certain character and instead of a character, you got just a black box or a black bar, right? That's because whoever designed this typeface did not complete the entire character set. They only did part of the character set, okay? In this character set, though, there is other data, two bits of data that uh, I want to stick in your head because they're important to what we were talking about earlier. One bit of data is, well, there's actually three bits of data. One bit of data is how wide is the bounding box for each character, right? So again, when we talked about monospace type, The bounding box, I feel like I've got a sneeze on deck. Yeah, it's going to happen. Think about baseball. <laughs> baseball, think about baseball. <laughs> um, so each one of the bounding boxes for each one of these characters in the monotype world is exactly the same width. If then we were looking at a character set like Helvetica, these I's versus the M's are on different size bounding boxes. So the size of the bounding box is one piece of it. There's a ton of data in this character set, right? But that's one piece of data. The other, another piece of data is where the baseline sits, okay? So If we talk about what the baseline is, and we'll go over this definition down the road, where does the bottom of this letter sit inside the bounding box? So if you have ever, uh, like I said, gotten a file and the person forgot to send you the font with the file and you loaded your version of the font, right, and things look different than what you were expecting, or you sent them back a proof and they said that's not the way it's supposed to look, that's happened to me, uh, redo it, so I wasted another 10 hours, right? Uh, things that may make things look different is where the character sits on the bounding box, or excuse me, on the baseline, and how big the bounding box is, okay? Lastly, one of the pieces of information that I want you to know is, okay, great. Well, if these bounding boxes are of different characters, right, there is then the kerning table. How close do these characters sit by default, right? So meaning, if we go back here and I type out something like, Two, two. Okay. 
and let's say this is set to zero tracking, zero kerning, or auto. If I then bring over a guide, look at that, they are sitting right identical. Okay, so if I then Make these uppercase. All right. You can see that <clears throat> obviously these bounding boxes, when they're lowercase, overlap each other. When they're uppercase as well, the W sits farther away than the O does. Okay, All right. so if we had these letters sitting next to each other, that is called the kerning table inside the font, right? How far do letters sit together when they are in letter pairs? Does that make sense? Who's ever heard the term, heard the term kerning? Okay, it's one of the things that we'll talk about later on down the road in this class, okay? <coughs> so uh, the width table, the kerning table, so the width table lists the horizontal space allotted to each character in the bounding box. The kerning table lists specific letter pairs, how the program should adjust the spacing between them, as well where the, um, the piece of type sits on the baseline. All right, so far so good. Font formats. There are three basic types of font formats. Postscript, <clears throat> true type, and open type. Postscript is the granddaddy of them all. Okay? So uh, postscripts used to be the standard in the publishing industry. Okay? So when we're talking font formats, if I go back here and look at that Euro style. Font format. These are all open type. So if you see the dot OTF, this is gonna become important down the road when we start uh, importing fonts into our web page that are stored on a server. The long and the short of it is, Back in the day, before most of you were born, probably, right? Uh, we used PostScript types. PostScript was a language developed by Adobe that helped this computer talk to that printer to print things out correctly. Okay. In terms of the Adobe PostScript uh, language, I won't get too far into that. We don't need to bore you. Let me ask you this. How many of you ever had like an Epson dot inkjet printer? Okay. Did you ever try to print something out and it said, uh, you can't print this out because PostScript is not installed? PostScript was a language then that would, the computer would talk to the printer to uh, basically upload the printer version of the font to the printer. That's how I kind of uh, layman's like understand it. So there are kind of two versions of each font. The screen version and the outline or printer version. Okay. Nowadays, they're not separated like that, like they used to be. Nowadays, both the screen version, the pixelated version that you see on the screen, and then the outline vector version that actually gets printed out, right? Again, layman's terms, kind of how I understand it, uh, is all encapsulated within each font file. 
Okay. <coughs> So PostScript was the original one. PostScript did not work universally Mac and PC. It's a problem. So uh, apparently Apple and Microsoft got together to try to make a version that worked both Mac and PC, and it sort of worked. Then uh, Adobe and Microsoft got together and made another version that was supposed to work both Mac and PC, and it sort of worked, right? Nowadays, tr most TrueType and OpenType will work both Mac and PC. So the moral of this story is when you are faced with the uh, file format, go with TrueType, which is .ttf, or open type, which is .otf. You might see one third version, or let's say it like this. If I <clears throat> go and take a look at my theme here, and I go and look at my style sheet, you will see this right here, at font face, font family, felt tip Roman, regular. So uh, I am housing my font, felt tip Roman, regular, on my server, which then when somebody gets to my web page, typically what happens is when you open a web page, it looks for the font on the device, on the computer. That's why it's a safe bet to go with Arial and Helvetica. Every computer known to me these days comes with Arial or Helvetica, same with font. But uh, a font like Celtic Roman is not, not packaged with the computer operating system. Okay? So we have to then store it on a server somewhere and load it into the web page. We'll go, so this is going to be part of what you guys are going to do down the road. But you can see here that there are different types. EOT, extended open type. WOFF, world open font format, I think. TTF, true type. Then there's the SVG, scalar, scalable vector graphics that we'll get into later. You are going to have to convert things to these file formats or run them on your machine just as an open type or a true type. Notice what file type is missing from this list. Who said PostScript? PostScript. PostScript is missing. Moral of the story. Don't use PostScript anymore. Fair? Okay. Now, let's talk about managing typefaces. We are going to be using a program called Suitcase Fusion. Okay? So if we go to now history of the font, yay, that one's done. Font management. So there are multiple different pieces of software to uh, manage type or manage your fonts. Because here's the thing, right? If I go to Illustrator and I look at all of these fonts that are available for use, okay? Let's just say noteworthy. Let's say I chose Noteworthy. So again, what is happening is Illustrator is accessing the font Noteworthy. Where on this hard drive is the font Noteworthy located? <laughs> Let me ask you a follow-up question. 
Where is the font folder located? It's in your system folder. In your system folder. Correct. That's the answer I'm looking for. Okay. So how a how a font becomes available for use, as I understand it, when you say install a font, how many of you have ever on a PC or a Mac double clicked a font and again it brings you up with so let's just find this one and it brings you up with something like this install font anybody okay on a PC if you double click a font it should bring you up with their font manager you install font and as far as I understand it what actually happens is it takes a copy of that font and put it puts it in the fonts folder in your system folder so the application, Illustrator, or any other application can access it. Does that make sense? So here's what you don't want to do. If you have a folder of Western fonts like this, and you look at this, and it says 163 megs, do you want to drag that whole folder into your system. Not unless you want the pinwheel of death to spin until you decide something got screwed up. Okay? In other words, the more fonts that are in your system folder, the slower your machine is going to run. So the answer then is to have these fonts then somewhere on your hard drive like in your documents folder, or uh, what I would recommend to all of you is download this file and uh, put it on your thumb drive, right, to use here in the classroom. So if then I wanted to <laughs> Let's say Pompiana. I don't know. Let's say uh, I am super in love with this typeface, this font, and I want to use it in my file. Well, right now, if I go look for it, All it's because they're all activated and this is the thing that uh, so Eric remember when I said I was going to show you the video so now I'm talking to Eric right the systems guy because I told him I was going to um, uh, what you do record this and talk to him about it so if we go into system fonts and we go to P O P O M no name yeah, no, it's not gonna search. There we go. P O M. There it is. It's activated. Interesting. You can deactivate it. Yeah. So you shouldn't have to. Right. So basically, we can activate permanently or undo, deactivate, we can activate it temporarily. Um, so if now this one is deactivated, let's see if it's gonna load an Illustrator. Pump, yep. Yeah, I feel like it still loads for some reason on these machines. Yeah, so this is the thing where uh, what Eric was saying was right now for the time being, um, it might not be live, active, and unactive. Let's, let's, uh, let's do what we did last time because uh, you guys possibly might want to do something like when we're talking about choosing a typeface. Why would you choose one typeface over another, right? Well, let's say I'm working on a cowboy type logo. Right, and so I look for cowboy fonts. Right, 
and I go to, let's do this. Let's go rope font, free rope fonts. And let's say I want to download this one, rope MF. And I am going to download it into, well, it's downloaded and downloads first. Rope. And now here's the true type font that I'm going to put in my documents folder. And hopefully rope is not already on here. Okay, so rope is not there. Right? So if I go to Illustrator, then if we go here, elemental P, R, O, rope is not here. But let's say I want to use rope. I can go here to suitcase then, which is our font management program. And I can say new set. And I can say cowboy project, because that's the name of the project I'm working on, right? And I can then go find this rope font. And I can put it in that folder. If I then activate this temporarily, what it has done, again, as far as I understand, is it has taken a copy of that rope font and put it into the fonts folder in the system folder. Now that it's done that, it should be available for me to use here in Illustrator. Let's see if that's going to work. Hey, look at that. It is working live. Yay. Well, Eric was unsure if it was going to work well, no, live. I told you that the suitcase says it doesn't work at 2017 on the website, but I never had any problems. Right, but Eric, the system guy, is, is trying to... Yeah. do this and he said that it may or may not work so regardless of that stuff okay uh, so again if I want to use rope I activate it right so for you guys what you guys need to do then for your type studies coming up here is you need to use your personal name Ava and a business name Come up with one. I had the softness, but then I changed it. What'd you have? The softness. Bless you. Yeah, thank you. Right. I think I should just do a game design. Yeah, some kind of. So you need to do a personal name, and you need to do a business name, and then you need to do a type study where you do this. Premium DW, whoops, that was already converted. Premium DW, let's take a look at what it looks like using rope. Is this going to be the font that ultimately I'm gonna use for my business name? No, why? What? Because it's hideous. It has nothing to do is with it something. hideous or is it just inappropriate for this name? Well, that's both, really. I mean, it's really inappropriate. <laughs> Correct. It's inappropriate for this business name. Okay. Let me show you where it is appropriate. Yeah. On your uh, bleeding cowboy. Cowboys. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. So let's say you're in a band and y'all are a band where y'all have fake names and the band is named 13th grade. Anybody know the, what 13th grade basically means? College. Community college, right? So we were 13th grade where 
uh, we were a bunch of kind of burnt out rock stars, sort of, that all had fake names. And we were uh, making our own school of rock. And we were going to teach new recruits all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Oh, here. Um, mine is not, not appropriate to say out loud in class. But uh, you can find it on my website somewhere and read it to yourself. And hopefully you laugh. <laughs> Um, but when they did hire me full time uh, to start out with the interview, I did make sure that uh, you all know what band I was in previously, and there are photos out there on the internet. And they were like, yeah, we don't care, because we know about that point. Okay, moving on. So this then poster here, I found this stock illustration on iStock, and I then used Rope to finish off the poster. And because we were, if there was one word that you could describe us, cheesy, could be that word. So appropriate? Does this poster look? How does this poster look to you, Dan? If you were, if you were, uh, I don't know, however many years old, and I don't know, and you were into seeing bands, and if you saw this poster, would you think to yourself, oh, I might go see that band. They look fun. Yes, you would. Okay. <laughs> yes, I would, Mike. Okay. Absolutely. I might even buy your album. You might even buy my album. Yeah. So what we're getting into now for the third phase of today is choosing a typeface. Why would you want to choose one typeface over another? Well, uh, first and foremost, if you have text in a paragraph, you want to choose a typeface based off of readability. Okay. So another story of mine. Uh, when I was in college, I was a freshman in college, and apparently I took a junior level literature class, and uh, they didn't want to have a count on my transcripts when I was graduating, but it counted. That's not the point of the story. But I was a freshman, and anybody ever been a freshman in college before? Do I need to go any further with that? Right? Let's just say I thought I knew more than I did. Right? And uh, I then wrote a paper, and it had something to do with kings and queens and that kind of stuff. And so the typeface font that I used to turn in my paper was... That. Uh, I didn't get a very good grade. <laughs> okay. And I was used to uh, getting good grades on things I wrote. I was always took pride in the fact that I wrote well and that I got good grades. And so when I got a really bad grade on my term or on my paper, I didn't understand why until I started teaching this class and I had a flashback. And I went, oh, oh because my whole paper was done in this font and when the instructor went to read it he struggled with readability now it may have been a conscious effort fuck that guy for turning that into me or not but my grade suffered because of readability that's what I'm guessing okay so there are typefaces Times New Roman, Century Old Style, Stemple, Palatino, right? These kind of classic typefaces that are readable in the paragraph body copy world. So on my resources page, there is a couple of articles, 30 fonts, all designers should know, 80 beautiful typefaces for professional design. Let's go to the Smashing Magazine one. These are what I call the classic typefaces. Right? So I would take a look at the, this list here. 
to or this list here. Because these have been proven to be useful, good looking, readable, etc. Somewhat boring, right? But they have a purpose. They're readable. Okay? Now, the other part of readability, or a part of readability, is serifs. The little kind of hands and feet on the letter forms. Back, way back when book publishing first came out, it was said that by having those finishing flourishes on each letter form, that we were able to distinguish each letter form over a non-serif letter form, right? Meaning, this has serifs. These have serifs. Helvetica does not, okay? So, in the web world, however, things have gotten better since we've started having the retina displays and the higher resolution displays. But in the web world, then, uh, mostly you have seen sans serif typefaces as body copy up until the last few years, right? True? Yes? No? Because when it comes to looking at something at 72 pixels per inch, if the type is very small, these little finishing flourishes, you can already see on the projector here, see how it kind of looks bitmapped right there, right? If they are very, very small, those finishing flourishes rendering at 72 pixels per inch are going to get blurry or going to get distorted and decrease readability. So that's why the trend is on the web for so many years to use sans serif blocky because the, the blockiness of the character uh, allowed the pixels to render them much nicer. Okay? Nowadays that we have devices that are 11 billion or so pixels, you know, our retina display phones and tablets and screens and that kind of stuff, uh, resolution isn't as much of a problem as it used to be. And now we are seeing uh, on sites like Smashing here, they are using serif typefaces, right, to um, then uh, as body copy, but they're using them big enough that we can distinguish the characters, okay? We'll get more into that as time progresses. Emphasis. We were talking about that, I think, a few weeks ago, or a couple, last week, right? Um, this is only week two, right? So not a few weeks ago, we were on break a few weeks ago. But if you want to emphasize one word over another, for instance, the traditional and easy way of expressing emphasis is to use a bold typeface in the midst of a regular typeface, creating the effect of visual punctuation. See what I did there? Uh, now, you may want to go more into the display world, but be careful about going into the display and decoration world. Okay, meaning you may want to, for your logo, Right? You might have some kind of a genre, like I said, cowboy. Well, if your genre is cowboy and you're doing a cheesy poster like this, the rope font or P.T. Barnum or some other type of typeface like that might be for you to express genre. So what do we mean by genre? Well, genre can be anything from a period of time to a group of people, in other words, our genre is Seattle Central students, right? Uh, to any kind of grouping is the way I understand it, any kind of grouping that then has their own distinct characteristics, right? Does that make sense? 
So, for instance, if you are, let's say, ATF Cooper Black, where has that been used? Yeah, possibly. A lot of 70s commercials, uh, Black Keys album. Right? So Cooper Black kind of looks retro, 70s. You expect a guy with a mustache to be like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> right? Or is that just me? You fit both. Okay. Pretty close. Yeah. How's it going? Okay. <laughs> or. Do I really? Perfect. Appropriate here because it's fat and round and squishy, right? Nobody lithos. What does that say? Yeah. Huh? Greek. Greek euro. Yeah. Like euro G Y R yeah. yeah. Not uh, EU. Euro. Okay. Then there are the decoration ones that really, really go after the genre, right? Uh, retro Paris, uh, circus, um, really bad alt country, right? Uh, B.A. Baracus. <laughs> Anybody? Who knows who B.A. Baracus is? You should know who B.A. Baracus is. Why? You didn't watch the 18 way back then? Well, I was going to oh. say, I was thinking 18. Yeah, 18. B.A. Baracus, Mr. T's character. No. Really? Like Breaking my heart. Mm -hmm. I like a Hulk. Or military, right? So those are the reasons why you would want to choose your typefaces. So what you need to do then is, here in suitcase, what you can do is this button. And start taking a look right so if I also do this where I for font library create a new set and I say Mike's fonts And I bring them in. Now, here's the thing. Suitcase is going to look for that folder of Western fonts in my documents folder every time it opens. So if you, again, uh, I don't think they have it set up to where, uh, well, we used to have our own home folders, which is kind of like the O drive on the Macs. Uh, that's trying to be recreated right now, right? So what you should probably do is store uh, that Western fonts folder on your thumb drive, and then you can do this and use it as a set in suitcase. So that if you then are looking through here, and there's also 
um, an extension in um, in Illustrator that's not working right now. That that's part of what Eric is working on, to where you would have the suitcase palette actually in Illustrator, right? Uh, but if we're back here in suitcase, and if you type in, you know, your personal and business name, and you can start going through quickly. And let's say, Ashley, you want to see how that looks. And if you go back here and we go to... Did you want Ashley? Look, it is. Oh, it is there. Yeah. Did you want both our name and our business name like that on the same um, sheet, or do you want one with one sheet of paper? With? One sheet that's personal. One sheet that's business. So what you what I would suggest you do is you use this as a template file, and then you save one as personal, one as business, and then basically you can, you know. And then if I wanted to use Ashley there. Again, all these shouldn't be activated right now. So that's stuff that I'm talking to Eric about. And then here, what I want you to do is as well. Tell me. what the typeface is, and do your type study like this. Now, uh, this is an old file, guides. Make sure guides are locked so that you don't accidentally bump those guides and delete them and stuff. So yeah, that's basically what I want you to do. and. Choose different typefaces from serif to sans serif to kind of quirky to really conservative to really not conservative, right? To just start seeing, you know, what do these typefaces say to me, right? Now here, this one, Bauhaus, is not loaded, okay? So here is where then what I would need to do is if I'm looking here at Mike's Fonts Bauhaus, I would then want to activate. And once I did that, it may, it may be Bauhaus Medium, so I might need to change this to Bauhaus Standard instead. Change that to Bauhaus standard. So what does then, like I said, if you were to describe this typeface to me, what, how would you describe it? I'm saying that. Cheesy whimsical. Cheesy whimsical. Cheesy whimsical cowboy. How would you describe this typeface to me? 70s. 70s? Reminds me of the old Pepsi cans they came out with in the 80s. Old Pepsi cans. Zoom. Or oh, the show Zoom. <clears throat> so, is that how I want premium design works to be represented? Is this how I want premium design works to be represented? Exactly, right? So what you need to do is just merely get a diff bunch of different fonts together and start your type study just to say, hmm, what works and what doesn't. Sound good? Was the demo in Suitcase and Illustrator, and then, of course, having it be recorded, right? Hopefully that's useful. 
uh, go back and take a look at the tape and how we're doing it. Um, but again, uh, Thursday will be open lab to work on these to start on the computer putting your name together, right? Uh, maybe start writing down typefaces that you see out there that you like, you know, and then when we come to class, um, you know, for instance, what was your name? Kim. Kim, stand up. Thrasher. Appropriate for that name? Does anybody know what Thrasher is? Skateboard? Skateboard stuff, right? Yeah, Skateboard Magazine. Does that typeface look appropriate for that? Yeah. Could. They also have one that's like in place. Yeah. It's still the same part. So start start doing that research and we'll start putting it together on Thursday. And does that make sense? Did you say where do you have that template? Maybe. So this template then is if you go to my logotype study one. Download that file. And here are the fonts from Mike. Is that still the template that has an obnoxious uh, artboard on it? Probably, yeah. yeah. It gives you the warning about legacy yeah. reports when you open it. Oh, yeah. So which one of you is going to redo that file for me? And then I can update the file in my folder. That'd be nice. Do you want it for CC 2017 or you want it for? Well, I guess it has to be. So yeah. Matter, yeah. 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 So yeah. Won't save anything legacy in 2016. Yeah. 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 So. That'd be great. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? So if you go to this page here, oh. if you just click on it, it should download a zip file. Same with the fonts, and it should download your downloads folder, or you can right click on it, I think, on a PC, and it'll say download wherever you want. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, for those of you that weren't here today, um, hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully it was uh, entertaining. Now, I'm going to talk about the extra assignment that I'm going to give everybody that is here. And those of you that aren't here aren't going to know what it is. See you.